The Triathlon Show 343. up everybody welcome back to another episode of that triathlon show the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com i'm your host michael and on today's episode i interview dr danielle muniz who has done some fascinating work utilizing big data from strava from marathon runners specifically where him and his co-author set out to explore how decoupling uh, meaning in this case specifically the ratio of heart rate to pace uh, can be an important parameter in marathon and possibly broader endurance performance. So we'll explore that, uh, the findings that Dr. Muniz and his co-authors found and uh, how that can be used in practice as well. But before that, big thanks to our sponsors, Roka. Roka produces exceptional quality triathlon wetsuits, tri suits, swim skins, goggles, performance sunglasses and prescription eyeglasses and sunglasses. Today, I want to talk a bit more about Roka's range of eyewear. All of Roka's eyeglasses and sunglasses come with Geeko anti-slip technology, so they never fall off your face. They are also extremely lightweight and have fantastic optics. The performance sunglasses are developed for and tested in the most challenging conditions in the world. They are used in sports from triathlon through speed skating, through outdoor and adventure activities. And for their range of prescription glasses, there is a home tryout program and you can renew your prescription with a simple online vision test at home in front of your computer. All products have multiple options for frames and lenses, and they all come with a two-year warranty. Uh, the glasses that I use personally are the Rory prescription glasses and the Phantom Aviator sunglasses, as well as the Matador and Matador Air performance sunglasses for sports. Visit roca.com forward slash TTS to get 20% off your entire order. And thank you to Zenate. The Zenate Indoor Swim Trainer is a swim training tool that you can use at home, allowing you to improve your technique work on power and stamina and save time and stay consistent it is a fantastic way to work on swim specific core activation as the instability element of the bench forces you to stabilize your core and it helps you work on a high elbow catch because the height of the swim bench is perfectly designed for forcing you to keep that elbow up you can get tips and specific workouts on how to use the trainer on the Senate social media channels like YouTube and Instagram. And the Senate Swim Trainer is very affordable, even more so with a 20% discount code that you can get on senatesumtrainer.com forward slash TTS. Now, without any further ado, let's get into the interview with Dr. Danielle Muniz. Welcome to the Triathlon Show, Danielle. How are you doing? Uh, I'm really good, thank you. Uh, can you start by just uh, giving an introduction of yourself to the listeners and the audience that might not know who you are? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my name is Daniel Muniz, um, and I'm, I'm a Spanish but living in the uh, in the UK. Um, I did my PhD uh, at St Mary's University in Twickenham, uh, which is West London, and now I work as a lecturer in physiology at uh, the University of Hertfordshire, which is again uh, close to London, just North London. Yeah, perfect. And uh, what what can you explain a bit more about what type of things you have been studying in your PhD and and in your postdoc studies? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so my PhD was on anaerobic capacity, which is probably far away from what most of your listeners will be. So we were trying to yeah. quantify uh, anaerobic energy production. Um, but during my PhD, I became interested in in critical power and critical speed. And, uh, and as well, W prime and D prime, which is the uh, anaerobic, um, if you wish, um, kind of component of the power duration relationship. And uh, since finishing my PhD, I am trying to, I guess, apply the critical power uh, W prime and critical speed D prime model to different situations. So prescribing exercise, um, kind of quantifying performance and, and a number of things. So trying to apply the model a little bit more. Yeah, that's great. And uh, many listeners will be very familiar with critical power and W prime because we've had yeah. we've had uh, guests like Mark Burnley on and uh, and many others talking about critical power before. Uh, so yeah, that's not a new concept uh, by any means. Um, the reason that I invited you on is uh, a study that you recently published uh, that was about decoupling of internal and external workload during marathon running. Uh, so uh, that is an open access paper. I'll link to it in the in the show notes, so listeners can go and read through it. But uh, can you introduce this paper? Uh, what did you want to investigate more specifically, and what was the background that led you to uh, to do this research? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So I guess if we start with the background, um, the first author I met actually, uh, Barry Smith, which is the first author of, of the paper, uh, that was probably three years ago at a conference. And uh, Barry is a um, data analyst, and uh, he's obviously very, very good with, with numbers and dealing with big data sets, but he also has an interest in marathon running. So when we met, he uh, he had this massive data set from Strava um, runners, uh, Strava athletes, I guess. And uh, I wanted to look at whether we can apply the critical speed um, concept to predict marathon performance in uh, just using raw training data. So just from your normal training data, whether we can get an estimation of critical speed and then whether that estimation can be used to, to play performance. Um, and, and we did that, we published that a uh, couple of years ago, but one of the key findings uh, that we saw in that paper was that uh, the best athletes in this data set were able to complete the marathon at a speed that were closer to the critical speed. So at a higher percentage of the critical speed. And uh, and the, I guess, less fit individuals, so uh, runners that complete the marathon in perhaps, you know, three hours, three and a half hours, four hours, they tend to do so at a lower percentage of their critical speed as well. So it's not just that your critical speed can determine performance, but also the percentage at which you um, of your critical speed that you run the the marathon. So with that in mind, can, then ju just just with one one follow up question on that, uh, yeah. can you uh, can you talk about what is the percentage that you found? For example, what is the difference in what is the percentage that a two and a half hour marathoner can run their marathon on average versus yeah, four hour marathon? Yeah, so uh, we my thought when we did that paper was that everyone was going to be at a close to maybe ninety ninety five percent of their critical speed. Um, there is some paper from um, Andy Jones and Annie Van Hattalo that uh, in elite top uh, world-class athletes, marathon runners, they run the uh, the marathon at 96, 97% of their critical speed. Uh, those are guys that are running the marathon in just over two hours. Um, for us, what we saw is that the average value was 85%, um, but we saw that people, runners that can run the marathon in, say, two and a half hours, they do so at around 90% of their critical speed. And then that goes down in a fairly linear fashion uh, to about 75, 78% of their critical speed for runners that complete the marathon in about uh, four hours or so. And it makes sense, right? Because if you're out there for four hours, then that's twice the duration of somebody that's out there for two hours. So naturally, you will have to be at a lower percentage of, of your critical speed uh, when you think yeah. of it as a duration rather than as a distance. Yeah. So we um so from with that in mind, I guess with that background, um, then uh, Ed Maunder published his uh, decoupling paper with uh, Steven Seller and others, and uh, we we kind of discussed that with some PhD students, and um, we we kind of link all, all the dots together. So we, we've got Barry with big, big data sets and the uh, computer skills to to analyze the data. Uh, we we've done this paper on critical speed we, where we saw that decline in uh, the percentage of critical speed that runs complete the marathon. And then Ed is publishing this decoupling paper. And uh, basically we got in touch with everyone. And uh, I guess that's where we end up doing this uh, this paper. Mm, yeah. So so what was the research question that you that you tried to examine here? So the uh, I guess the, re the broad idea, the broad research question was, is this phenomenon that uh, this is describing uh, really happening in marathon runners. And uh, do we need to take this into consideration? Is this going to make a difference for the average marathon runner? And uh, I guess what we found, um, one of the key messages was that this, this is indeed happening. So we saw that, again, better marathon runners show a um, low decoupling in the uh, internal to external uh, workload. And uh, I guess less or slower runners, less fit individuals tend to exhibit a, a greater magnitude, a greater size of this decoupling in a internal to external um, workload. Mm. And, and let's, again, let, let, let's define decoupling first, by the way, for listeners that yeah, are not familiar. Yeah, so decoupling is, I guess it's, a, it's sort of the, the, the easy definition, to put it simply, is uh, you calculate your internal workload, so how much physiological stress you are under, 
and the external workload, which could be something like your speed if you're running or your power output if you're if you're cycling. And uh, you calculate that ratio early in the race or early in the training session, and then you see how that ratio kind of whether it increases, meaning that for the same speed, you are under an increased level of physiological stress. Um, and we looked at the, the size of that decoupling and also where that decoupling starts, at what point that decoupling starts. Mm-hmm. So when, when you're looking at internal workload, uh, in theory, it could be oxygen uptake or lactate. But in this case, it was heart rate that you looked at. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think it probably would be better if you have access to uh, measures of, you know, as you say, VO2, oxygen uptake uh, or, or lactate. Um, but in this particular, because we are using Strava, we were using Strava uh, data from uh, Strava. We only had access to to heart rate, and uh, and we had to go with with that. Um, so I think heart rate is a it's a kind of accessible, easy enough to use metric that most of your audience can can implement. Yeah. So so if we go in a bit more detail about the the methods, uh, how how did you calculate decoupling? In this case, uh, you you took two different points in the marathon where you had for the yeah, reference so, numbers. Yeah. Um, so we. The data that we have, uh, we split into, so it's obviously mar- a full marathon, uh, and we also have um, the, I think it was the uh, six months of training before the uh, the four, before the marathon, four to, four to six months, I can't remember now. Um, and what we did first, uh, we looked at, uh, we estimated their critical speed um, by using their best performance over a set of distances in their training. Um, and then we looked at the marathon data. We calculated the, the critical speed. Um, and we were looking at that ratio between the internal and external workload, uh, over 5k intervals. So start of the race, zero to 5k, then five to 10k, 10 to 15 and so on. Uh, we kind of ignored the first 5k because we kind of assumed that people were not running at a constant pace and just, you know, beginning of the race, maybe some level of stress there, trying to get a, on, a, on a good spot. Um, so we, we normalized relative to the 5 to 10K uh, segment of the, of the marathon. And then we looked at that ratio between the internal and external workload at 5K uh, segments. So the uh, 10 to 15, 15 to 20, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and you took the... 35 to 40 kilometer segment as yeah, the so one that you we calculated. The, uh, to calculate the, the size of that decoupling, uh, we looked at the, the last 5K segment, so the mm-hmm. 35 to 40K. Yeah. And in addition to the size, you also looked at the onset uh, of decoupling and how yeah. how did you uh, yeah, we, we, that? Yeah, we, we wanted to look at when this is starting to, you know, when do we first see this decoupling? And um, we, we had to define a starting point. So we opted for uh, a 2.5% in this decoupling, uh, which is a completely arbitrary value, but we had to go with something. Um, and we've, we've opted for this 2.5%. And um, we looked at basically when that decoupling exceeds that 2.5% and stays above that 2.5% for the remaining of the race. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that would be, let's say your you're starting your marathon at 150 beats per minute when you get to roughly 155 beats per minute if i do my math right that would be when when you when you yeah, define assuming the assuming that you're running assuming you're running at a constant at the same speed, speed. exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 um okay so so just to to summarize for the listeners so so you basically looked at these two things the magnitude of the decoupling which was the comparison of uh the 35 to 40 kilometer segment with the 5 to 10 kilometer segment and yeah. again if you're running at a constant speed throughout then you could and let's say you were running at 150 beats per minute in the first segment of those segments and then 165 to make the math easy in the 35 to 40 kilometer then you would have a 10 percent decoupling because of a 15 beats per minute increase from 150 uh to to give an example and uh yeah that onset uh, again we just talked about but when when the heart the internal workload rose by 2.5 percent for a fixed external yeah. workload and of course it works you can do the math even if the pace changes so that's and that's obviously yeah. what you what you did and, and you had eight, 82,000 yeah sorry go on. 
No, I just a quick point um, because I think one of the things that we, we saw is that I mean you, you might expect heart rate to drift up a little bit, but what we saw is that the heart rate actually remained fairly constant, and what was a bit of a decline was the uh, was the, mm. the speed, the pacing of the marathon. So yep. basically, you are running at the same heart rate, your 150 or 160, whatever, uh, but actually you are slowing down uh, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you had important to point out is that you had 82,000 uh, plus uh, runners in this data set. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's I guess, the, the strength of the study. We um, So that's different. That's kind of new to me. I'm, I'm an exercise physiologist. So we usually deal with much way smaller sample sizes of, you know, 15, 20 uh, athletes that we managed to get in the lab. Uh, and here we have access to a massive data set uh, from Strava. And um I guess we have to make some compromises. So, you know, we're talking about the heart rate before, which perhaps is not the best, uh, but it's, it's, it's handy. It's a handy metric. Um, but yeah, we have a, a massive data set of, of runners. Yeah. So then, so then you looked at, okay, how did the decoupling both the onset and the magnitude relate to, to marathon performance? Can, can you explain that bit, uh, how, how you did that and what did you find? Yeah. So I, I, Going back to that paper uh, that we published a couple of years ago, so remember we, we saw that um, faster runners can run at a f- higher percentage of their critical speed. And what we show here is that those faster runners, I think, or kind of our sort of hypothesis would be that uh, they can run at a higher percentage of their critical speed because they are able to maintain uh, that critical speed throughout the marathon. So what, what we think... or or I guess I think might be happening, is that when you start uh, your marathon, your critical speed is here at this value, at this intensity, for example, at this pace. Um, but as you progress into the race, that critical speed is going to deteriorate. It's going to start to go down slowly. And uh, if you are able to minimize the degree of that decrease in critical speed, you, you are able to run at a higher percentage of that critical speed for the whole of the marathon. Um, so what we saw in this paper was that those athletes that uh, exhibit a low amplitude in this decoupling were able to run the marathon faster than uh, than athletes that exhibit a, a greater percentage. But not only that, they can also run the marathon at a higher percentage of their critical speed. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Didn't Andy yes. Jones publish some uh, data where they, they looked at exactly how much critical power decreases after you've done some kind of long and moderately hard exercise? Yeah, yeah. So there's a couple of two or three papers uh, from Andy Jones's lab in Exeter uh, looking at precisely this. So they, they actually got people to, uh, or they calculated their critical power before and after a couple of hours of, of cycling at a fairly decent pace. And, uh, and they saw it's something around that 10% uh, decrease in um, in critical power over the two-hour period, which kind of matches what we are seeing here with this, you know, being able to perform the, the marathon at around 90% if you are fairly fit mm. of your critical speed. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, 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 that's a good uh, well, it aligns well. It, it aligns well with with those previous uh, findings. So, um, so you said that the the amplitude uh, was well correlated with uh, with the percentage of critical speed that the runners could maintain. W- what about the onset? Did that have uh, any relation to to other key yeah. variables you looked at? Yeah, I, th- I think the onset was also able to predict uh, performance and probably. Based on what the data that we have, uh, it, the, probably, the, the, the two probably go together. So if you, there seems to be a fairly linear uh, rate of decoupling. So the, the speed at which you are decoupling, if that makes sense, uh, is probably fairly linear. So if you start early, you're probably going to have, you're going to end up having a, a larger magnitude in this decoupling. And if you are able to delay that onset of decoupling, the final magnitude is, is going to be smaller. Yeah. Um, so I do believe, though, that the uh, magnitude, the, the total size of this decoupling is, uh, as I see it anyway, more important than the onset. Because there might be athletes, and that's perhaps something that we need to look further, but there might be athletes that do start to exhibit some degree of decoupling, 
but then that that rate of decoupling is uh, not so fast. So you, you start to decouple early uh, or earlier, but you don't see a, a massive uh, final magnitude in the decoupling. Yeah, yeah. I, so if I understand that correctly, basically they could be they they could be related or the same. Basically, we don't we don't quite know if they're independent we, or, we don't, or we not. We don't know. I, yeah. I, I certainly don't know. Um, I think they're going to be related. Um, yeah. um, but I think that the main, uh, if we have to kind of pick one, obviously I think we, we know we try to look at the two of them. Um, but to me, the magnitude will be the uh, main driver in kind of ability to maintain a high percentage of your critical speed or your critical power. Yeah, yeah. And and by that, obviously, uh, we mean that the the less the decoupling you have, then the the better your ability to maintain a high percentage of critical speed. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So what do you think? What does what do you think this means in or first of all, if we start with just general key points and this doesn't have to be this could be for the scientific and academic community as much as for practitioners and athletes, but yeah, what are the key points to take away from this study? Um I think the the key point and there seems to be a kind of growing body of, of papers and data showing that um don't assume that your physiology at the beginning of the race is going to be the same as the physiology, say, two, three, four hours into, in this case, the marathon. Um, there is going to be uh, some deterioration in your in your physiology, in your VO2 max, in your thresholds, and your critical speed or critical power. And uh, I think the key message is that we need to look at this. Um, we need to, you know, same as you do your VO2 max and same as you do your lactate threshold and you, you kind of calculate those values, we need to think about how those, uh, how that physiology is going to be affected by a couple of hours, three hours of uh, of heavy intensity exercise. Yeah, and I did an interview with Ed Wonder and Steven Seiler that you mentioned about uh, fatigue resistance or durability, and we talked about that. I'll link to it in the show notes for listeners that haven't listened to it. But um, yeah, basically, uh, I think this is a really interesting case of a potential measure of uh of that fatigue resistance durability that we we specifically talked about that yeah it's this is an interesting concept but we don't really know yet how to measure it and and maybe this decoupling can be one one way of at least getting getting some some insight that we can quantify about your uh durability yeah i, th- I think the uh decoupling is perhaps not the best way of measuring fatigue or fatigability um, but it's definitely something that most athletes can use on a you know daily basis or, or regular basis. It's something that is, I think, easy enough to do, uh, and it can be can have very clear pl- uh, practical implications. Yeah, and well, that's that's going to be my next question. Then, what what do you think are the practical applications of using decoupling in general and and your studies, uh, your your findings in this study in particular? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the the as I said, to me, how I see this is uh, we need to we need to check this. We need to be aware of how uh, your your ability is gonna kind of perform in a in a prolonged exercise. So um, I guess the, the the main thing I would suggest or I, I would recommend at least is to um, check if they can the decoupling uh, during a kind of one of the long run, if you you know what I mean, the uh, prolonged exercise uh, training that they might be doing. Um, I will recommend that they they check that um and as well during the marathon if you are racing and you start to see that there is some decoupling uh that's something that perhaps we can kind of pay attention during the actual race um i would love and i think that you know i think you mentioned about mark bonley he was talking about um kind of incorporating critical speed and 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 d prime and all of that to the technology all this technology that we are having nowadays with your gps and all your sensors so I, I do think that in a few years' time, there are going to be, you know, your, your Garmin watch or whatever um, is going to incorporate some metrics that kind of link your your physiological stress, your heart rate, for example, and your kind of external uh, workload, your, your speed or your power if you're cycling. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think that's, we are the beginning of implementing all of this, but I think there is, um, there is going to be quite a bit of work on, on implementing all of this into 
uh, I guess, tools that can help athletes. Yeah. How would you use it as an athlete if you're training for a marathon and you go out for your long run, as you say, would you, um, would you mostly analyze it kind of week by week that, okay, I'm since one month ago, I'm now, my decoupling is a lot lower, lower magnitude, or what, or would you, would you use it even within the workout? What do you need to be quite controlled in the way that you use it in, in similar conditions, similar workouts? Can you give some tips for yeah, going a bit yeah, deeper into no, the practical that's, applications. Um, that's a that's a good question. Um, I I guess I will try to control um, or try to measure the coupling in the uh, certainly in the weeks leading to the marathon, um, and particularly in those sessions that are going to be uh, more specific and that are going to be most similar to the actual event. So if you go for a I don't know twenty five thirty k run. Uh, I will try to keep an eye on the internal workload in your heart rate and your external workload, your your speed, and see how that ratio between the two changes from say the first ten minutes to the you know half an hour, an hour, an hour and a half into the into the run. Um, I guess something that we don't quite know is um, if you detect that there is a decoupling and you want to address that and you want to minimize that. Um, at the moment, we don't have very good data on what we can do to minimize that. So we know this is happening, um, but we don't necessarily know why this is happening or what can you do to uh, address this issue. If you see that this, you know, you go for a run and you see that there is, I'm, I'm experiencing decoupling, what can I do about it? Um, at the moment, we don't quite know what type of training uh, you can do to reduce that, to address that issue. So um, I, I mean, we can hypothesize, we can argue that, I guess in my view, going for long uh, exercise sessions, you know, your long runs is probably going to help. Um, but as far as I know, we don't have you know, good solid data on, uh, on what exactly you can do to, to, to try to minimize that decoupling. Yeah. Um, that makes, coming back to the, um, the practical use and the long run, using it in the long run as you, just one thing that I'm thinking of is that maybe you could use it as a bit of a, a safety check almost when you're doing your marathon specific workout. Let's say you're doing five kilometers of marathon pace within a long run in kilometer five to 10 of your long run. And then you're doing another five kilometer in kilometer 25 to 30 in your long run. And maybe you're having one in the middle as well. But comparing those two five kilometers, if you check your decoupling and you find that, oh, it's 1.40 or something, then based on the, uh, let's call it normative uh, reference values that you have uh, you have from this study, the, the, the runner in this case can maybe know that, okay, maybe this pace is not sustainable for me yeah. for a marathon if I have this magnitude of decoupling. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I think if you, as you say, if you are... Um, exercising at what you think is going to be your marathon pace and you start to see a, a decoupling of 1.1, 1.2. So that's a 10% or 20% uh, decoupling in internal to external workload. That's going to be a red flag. And it's like, oh, I need to I need to revisit my pacing strategy for the marathon because that, that might not be sustainable and might, and might suffer later on in the, uh, in the race. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then, uh, coming back to what you were just discussing about how to, how to work on it and potentially improve it. Um, do we know anything about the, not, I'm not asking now about how to improve it, but just the, the mechanisms behind, behind decoupling? Um, n- not exactly about decoupling. We, we can, again, we can sort of speculate with things that are, are likely to have an effect. Um, I think the cobbling is going to be affected by quite, it's obviously a, a complex trait. So it's going to be quite a few things that determine your, your decoupling. Um, but I don't think there is, again, kind of solid data on exactly what determines the, the size, the magnitude of the decoupling that you might or might not experience. Um, I guess we can, we can look at things like your, you know, percentage of, uh, of muscle fibers, the type one muscle fibers, which are more, fatigue resistant, uh, the glycogen stores or glycogen depletion that you might experience during the race and uh, whether you can sort of implement some strategies to maintain those stores uh, during the race. 
uh, things like um, heat accumulation, so thermal regulation uh, might be a factor as well. So th th there are quite a few kind of factors. Your, again, your, your mitochondria machinery, if you want, or your uh, mitochondria density, all of those things are likely to contribute to the uh, the coupling that you know someone experiences. Um, but we don't have we don't have that data as far as I know anyway, uh, just yet. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, yeah, I'm just looking through my list of questions here to see what we didn't cover. Um, da -da -da. It's just, just just to add, I think particularly in running, um, muscle damage is probably going to be a, a, a another factor that perhaps you know contributes. So basically, your your running economy, your running efficiency, uh, is going to be compromised during running, perhaps to a greater extent than, than during cycling, uh, because you have that kind of eccentric component. Um, so th there are a few things. Th that then, you, then, then you could even hypothesize that what shoes you choose to run in could have an, could have an effect, because they might might have an impact on how much muscle damage you, uh, yeah, you experience. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, what I was going to ask uh, next was uh, whether you think decoupling is how much it might be related to your, let's say, your critical speed or your general capacity in a fresh state, or how much uh, it is completely independent, uh, independent of that. Is that something you can speculate about? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I can't speculate. Um, I don't know if those runners that uh, show low decoupling um, do that because that's something, it's a kind of a consequence of the training that they do uh, or, or uh, and then basically that allows them to, so you do some training, this type of training, this volume of training, this intensity, then that has an effect on your decoupling uh, and then that affects your performance or whether it's kind of the other way around, uh, whether it's your, you know, some inherited characteristics that you have, and then that allows you to do the training and then allows you to, to run a high percentage and maintain that high percentage of your critical speed throughout the marathon. So I, I, I think it's going to be a, a combination of some sort of physiological traits that you might have, but also uh, what type of training you do uh, and whether you're, you know, how your training distribution and, and all of those things uh, can probably affect your your decoupling and the size and, and onset of decoupling. Yeah, and, and probably there is a lot of overlap between the the adaptations so, yeah. to yeah. to training because if somebody has a very high critical speed, then that's normally because they have been training a lot and they exactly. are also doing yeah. long runs and things like that. Yeah. That will Absolutely. all of that Absolutely. will contribute to to also yeah. better. I, I think these two are going to overlap quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And one thing that you, that you found that was quite interesting uh, was that when you separately analyzed females versus males, you found that the females had lower uh, magnitude of decoupling and a later onset of decoupling. Uh, so what do you think uh, are, might be the reasons for that? Um, yeah. So with females, um, they, they have, as, as expected, a, a low critical speed. But what we found was that they, they run at a high percentage of their critical speed. And they also exhibit a low decoupling uh, compared to, to male athletes. Why that is happening? Again, probably there's quite a bit of research on uh, females having, uh, for example, their thresholds at a high percentage of their VH max. So their lactate threshold, for example, happens at a higher percentage closer to their VH mass compared to males. Uh, so I think that's all kind of building the, the picture that uh, females are more fatigue resistant than, than males. And uh, why that happens, again, it, it's going to go back to the uh, those sort of potential factors that we think can contribute to um, to decoupling. So muscle fibers, we know that females have a high percentage on average of type 1 muscle fibers, which are more fatigue resistant. Uh, Females have a higher volume and density of mitochondria. So all of those kind of factors uh, that potentially determine the coupling, uh, it seems that females have a, a better profile to be able to cope with uh, or to be able to kind of uh, prevent this declining in critical speed and basically fatigability during exercise. Mm, yeah. So, 
And, and that, that makes sense when we look at um, some in ultra running, for example, you have some examples of like when you get to 200 mile races, we have some like Courtney, what is her name? Courtney D. D like, yeah, I can't remember the name, but I know. Yeah. That, yes. I guess it's a basically females uh, outperform males. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ultra US event. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, maybe that's too, even too long too, because there's so much else that goes into uh, that than just the physi- physiology. Like psych- psychology starts to play a massive role. But uh, but I, yeah, I think that's there's the cl- the gap does seem to close uh, over longer distances compared to let's say the fifteen hundred or eight hundred or one hundred oh. meters if, if you look yeah. at the percentages. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So it, it seems that the, the longer you go, that gap, which is usually about ten percent. Uh, for for males so males running about 10 percent faster than than females uh when you go to kind of the the in units and towards ultra us events um that gap seems to be closing and, and as you said there's few examples of females uh i think don't, I, I don't think on average females are gonna outperform males in ultra us events um but this certainly they, they are more, but by the looks of it, but the data that we have and, and from uh, lab data from other groups, uh, they seem to be more fatigue resistant uh, compared to 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 males. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and uh, the final question on this topic, I guess, is uh, where do you see future research going? Do you already have some some follow up studies uh, that you're working on, uh, or? What do you? What would you want to see done in in this yeah, research? Yeah, So we 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 did um, a follow up study uh, trying to. So one of the limitations of this approach, the way we calculate critical speed, is based on the best performance. So your your best uh, your fastest speed over eight hundred meters, one k, one point five k, three k, and so on. So over a range of distances, uh, but that doesn't mean that your best performance is your maximal performance. And if we want to calculate critical speed, we should be doing maximal effort. So that's, that's, a, that's a limitation of this approach that we are taking. Um, so we did a study uh, during lockdown trying to basically compare, you know, we got a group of people um, and we asked them to just do your normal training uh, for six weeks. And then um, we asked them to do some intentional maximal efforts. And, uh, and we saw that, I guess, as, as one would expect, uh, when you ask them to do maximal efforts, um, the critical speed that we were able to estimate, as opposed to just data from the raw, normal, regular training data, um, the, the estimation of critical speed was higher when you ask them to do a maximal effort, um, mm. which which I think makes sense. Uh, I guess that the, the, the thing is the difference wasn't so high it was only uh, about one kilometer per hour so it wasn't a huge difference so i yeah. think if you have um enough data you can make this this kind of take this approach forward uh, but that's that's something that we did um over lockdown we also want to look at um that's something we are working with barry uh trying to predict from the training data we have uh the the coping that we saw in the marathon so um, I think we're starting to look at things like uh, the number of long runs, the training volume that you do, and whether all those things uh, can help predict whether you are going to experience the coping during, uh, during your marathon. Um, mm-hmm. And at the moment, we are not seeing any obvious trends, but we need to look at uh, that data a bit you know, more closely and see if we can sort of get some insight as to what might be... Uh, helpful in terms of training to try to minimize that decoupling yeah yeah well that will be interesting to to follow and mm. see if you find anything because as you say then if if you find any any relation there then that could also potentially be uh, used in a prescriptive way for when when training for these long events where where it is important to minimize the decline in performance mm. um yeah so uh, then Moving on from decoupling to a, just a general question for you as a, a physiologist, uh, if you could give three pieces of advice for the listeners of this podcast on how to improve their uh, endurance performance, uh, what would that be? Um, I guess b- based on, <laughs> I'm trying to think. There was there was a uh, a tweet from Mike Joyner a uh, long time ago. It was like uh, run a lot of miles. 
uh, some of them faster than uh, your race pace and uh, and you know rest. <laughs> so I think you know keep keep. I guess my my biggest advice will be to uh, do your basics right um, and ensure you you know you you do your training and do your resting and you, you follow the, the kind of the basic principles and that's going to take you a long way. Um, and don't make things overly complicated. Uh, just do your basics right. You know, do your, yeah. your basic training right, and that's going to take you a long way. I think that will be yeah. my, my advice. That's, that's really excellent advice. I love that. <laughs> uh, summed it up very nicely. Uh, and then uh, finally, let's do some rapid fire questions. So take just one sentence to answer each of these. And the first one is yeah. what's your favorite book or resource related to endurance sports? Um, so for book, I read the sports gym by David Epstein, which is now a few years old, to be fair. But I did that as a PhD student and I loved it. So, um, yeah, I think that, yeah. that's the one. Yeah, that's great. And uh, what's an important habit that you have benefited from athletically, professionally or personally? Um, I think from a professional point of view, uh, I would say just talk to people, just engage in discussions with, with everyone and everyone that you come across. Um, people usually love to talk about their research. So just, yeah, just go and talk to people and engage with discussions and, and, you know, don't be shy of put yourself out there, I guess. Great. And uh, finally, who's somebody that you look up to or that has inspired you? Um, I guess looking at, you know, if, if we are talking about, or if I am working in the field of kind of critical power, critical speed, uh, I would say probably Andy Jones has been a reference, you know, all his work in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, and I would just say Mark Burnley as well, who is... Uh, we, we are doing some sort of projects together as well. Uh, so I think them two are really uh, people that I aspire to, to be like, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And Jones is also a, a past guest on the podcast. So I'll, I'll try to remember to put that and that link as well as the one to Mark Burnley's episodes that he has done. So yeah. uh, related, related listening for, uh, for listeners that uh, find this topic interesting. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, Daniel, do you have a, uh, on any online or social media presence where people can follow you or any projects that you want to mention or ventures you want to plug or anything um, like that? I, I mean, I've, I've got a tweet. I'm not the very active on Twitter, but um, my Twitter is uh, Daniel underscore Munith underscore. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to interact and chat to people. So yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. It was great to talk to you. Thank you for uh, for sharing your insights from your research, and uh, you're looking forward to seeing what you come up with next in the in the future research projects that you have going going on. No, thank you for having me. Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed that interview. As always, you can find the show notes on scientifictriathlon.com uh, with link to uh, Dr. Moniz's profile on ResearchGate and Twitter, as well as, of course, the paper we discussed today, which is called Decoupling of Internal and External Workload During a Marathon, Analysis of Durability in 82,303 Recreational Runners. Uh, there are some other uh, episodes that we mentioned and papers that I will link to as well that are relevant, so check out the show notes or the episode description. Also, just a reminder, especially if you are new to the podcast that there is a ton of content in the archives of the podcast uh, including both interviews you can you can search by category on the website and you can also look up the beginner tip episodes the q a episodes and so on the best place to find this all organized is on the website scientifictriathlon.com so check that out especially if you're new to the podcast and you want more content and to catch up on your favorite topics if you want to improve your triathlon performance and want help to achieve your goals, then consider working with a scientific triathlon coach or training plan. Whether you're just getting into triathlon or you're tra trying to qualify for a world championship event or even want to race professionally, we have experience in all of those scenarios and we'd love to discuss further around if and how we can help you on your triathlon journey. Find out more and contact us on scientifictriathlon.com and we can discuss your specific goals and needs and see what's best for you. Finally, big thanks to our sponsors, Roka, that you can find on roka.com. Check out their wetsuits, tri suits, swim skins, goggles, and exceptional sunglasses and prescription glasses for everything from day to day wear to extreme action sports. Use the promo code that you can get on roka.com forward slash TTS to get 20% off your entire Roka order. And thank you to Senate. Use the Senate Swim Trainer to improve your technique, power, stamina, and your swim training consistency. Get 20% off your order on the Swim Trainer with a promo code that you can get on senateswimtrainer.com forward slash TTS. And don't forget that it, this is a risk free investment. If you don't love it after two weeks, you can send it back and you'll get a full refund. 
Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.